peace to you, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, through our Lord and Savior Jesus, through God our Father. Amen. If you are here on Sunday, you maybe notice that our, our scripture lessons were a little bit of a roller coaster ride. Sometimes as I, I stand up and I read the lessons, I, I wish I had a little bit more time to talk about them because some of them I know just bring up questions in the minds of people as, as we listen to them. And I, I think that was especially the case this past Sunday. Our, our Old Testament lesson took us all the way back to the time of Moses in the book of Numbers, uh, to a time that we really don't have that much detail about, but we know it took place after God's people had refused to go into the promised land when he had brought them there. They had rebelled against God and said they were not going in, so he had banished them to 40 years of wandering about in the wilderness. And some time after that, we have the account in Numbers 16 when the people again began to rebel against God. There was a Levite named Korah, two men from the tribe of Reuben named Dathan, and Abiram, and 250 other elders from amongst the people of Israel, who started to challenge Aaron and Moses, questioning whether Aaron had any right to call himself the high priest, whether Moses had any right to set himself up as the leader over God's people, when it wasn't, in fact, Aaron or Moses who had appointed themselves to those positions, but God. And so what takes place next is something that I think leaves us feeling a little uneasy. We hear that God's answer was to open up the ground to swallow Dathan and Abiram and Korah and their families alive and then close in over top of them. And that God then sent down fire from heaven to destroy the other 250 men who were beginning to lead this rebellion against him and his chosen leaders. And if that's not bad enough, if you back up in Numbers 16, it could have been even worse. God had come to the point where he told Moses and Aaron, you go and stand away from the people, get as far away from them as you can, because I am about to destroy all of them, the entire assembly. And Moses and Aaron prayed to God. They prayed to him a really wonderful prayer. They said, O God, the God who gives breath to all living things, will you be angry with the entire assembly when only one man sins? In other words, are you going to punish the entire nation, Lord, for the sake of one person, or in this case, these these 250 men who are leading this rebellion? So God heard their prayer, and he told Moses, tell the assembly then, to get away from the tents of Dathan and Abiram. And after the assembly had moved away, God carried out the punishment that that we've heard. His judgment in that situation was extremely severe. And it serves to, to teach us some very important lessons. First of all, it teaches us that when we rebel against or disrespect God's chosen representatives that he views it just the same as if we were disrespecting or rebelling against him himself. And secondly, when we rebel against God, it is not something that he takes lightly. So much so that he was ready and would have been justified in doing so to wipe out this entire nation of Israel whom he had delivered out of Egypt and led to this promised land but for the prayer of Moses and Aaron. And then he decided to spare them and to serve as an example, punish only the families of those ringleaders of this rebellion. It's an example that we would do well to take notice of and and to heed that God's law is clear. The wages of sin is death. If we turn against, rebel against the God, as Moses and Aaron call him, the God who gives breath to all living things. If we walk away from the God who gives the breath of life, we're walking away from that gift of the breath of life. And the result then, the consequence of our sin is that we lose the breath of life. We 
receive for our sin, death. But God doesn't want us to die. In our prayer of the church on Sunday, we heard part of a verse from Ezekiel 33 where God says, As surely as I live, declares the Sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn. Turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, O people of Israel? That call from God, that that morning cry for his people to turn is a cry that we heard Jesus speaking in our gospel lesson on Sunday too. Some people had come to him and asked what it meant about the Galileans who had been tragically executed by Pilate. And their blood was mixed in with the sacrifices that they were offering. In response to, to those people and And speaking also about those in Jerusalem whom this tower, a tower called Siloam, had fallen on, Jesus asked them this question. He said, Do you think that they were worse sinners than all the other Galileans? Or more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem that they died in this fashion? And he answered it for them. He said, I tell you, no. But unless you turn from your sins, unless you repent, you too will all perish. And we could maybe see Jesus standing there with the Israelite people some 1,500 years before asking the same question. Do you think Dathan and Abiram and Korah were more guilty than the rest of you? Were worse sinners than the rest of you, Israel? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. And maybe instead of backing up 1,500 years, we could fast forward 2,000 years and imagine Jesus standing here asking us the same question. Pick your tragedy of the day. Do you think that the people who have died over the last few years from this virus, the people who are dying right now in in the wars that are raging in Ukraine or, or elsewhere around the world, do you think the people who die right here in our own city as a result of crime and, and, and recklessness? Do you think they're more guilty of rebellion against God than you? Do you think that you are any less deserving of death than they are? No, Jesus tells us. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Because the one thing that we all have in common, us here, the Israelites in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, the the Hebrews in the wilderness 3,500 years ago, we have all rebelled against our God. And he does not take that rebellion lightly. So what do we do? Jesus cries out, turn. Turn from your sin. And so we look to that word turn, which means we translate it also repent. And that teaches us something about repentance, that if I, if I want to be saved from my sin, I have to repent. That means I'm turning away from my sin, away from this life of sin. But turning to what? What can I rely on? Where can I find hope if my faithfulness to God is so miserable that I either have to repent or perish for all eternity. I can't go to the law. I can't go to my faithfulness to God, my, my obedience to his commandments. Where do I turn? And that's where our lesson from Galatians chapter 3 takes us this evening. The Apostle Paul, speaking to the early Christian church and, and speaking to us today, shows us where to turn. He says, in repentance, we turn to the promise. In repentance, we turn to the covenant of God's grace. In repentance, we turn not to the law or to our own righteousness. We turn to Jesus Christ, who is life. Jesus, who gives life to us. Not just life here in this world, but life with a capital L, everlasting life. We turn to 
to him. So we go to Galatians chapter 3, beginning at verse 15. I'm going to interrupt a few times to help us to make sense of what I think is otherwise a bit of a difficult passage. Beginning at verse 15, he tells us, brothers and sisters, let me take an example from everyday life. Just as no one can set aside or add to a human covenant that has been duly established, so it is in this case. Heather and I are in the middle of the process of writing out our wills, which is probably about the best or most familiar example of a human covenant that we have today. And when you write your will, once it's done and it's, it's finalized, it's duly established, there isn't anything that anyone else can do to change it. Not even after I'm dead will anybody be able to come forward and say, well, actually what he meant to say was this, or I think he really wanted that to go to this person or this to go to that person. Once the will has been established, it's final. And the same thing is true, the Apostle Paul is telling us, when it comes to God's will. Once God's will had been established, the inheritance that he was leaving for you and for me, once it had been finalized, there was nothing that could come or would ever come that could change it. And God's will was established way back in the beginning when he gave the promise of the coming Savior. And Paul goes on to talk about that promise, those promises in verse 16. He says, the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Scripture doesn't say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but and to your seed, meaning one person, who is Christ. On more than one occasion, God came to Abraham and he promised him, all nations on earth will be blessed through your seed. And Paul is clarifying for us that when God said through your seed, he's speaking of one specific descendant of Abraham's through whom everyone in this world would be saved. And that descendant we know is Jesus Christ. He goes on, what I mean is this, the law introduced 430 years later does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. For if the inheritance depends on the law, then it no longer depends on the promise. But God in his grace gave it to Abraham through a promise. Hundreds of years after Abraham, after God had given the promise of the coming blessing to Abraham. He gave his law to his people through Moses on Mount Sinai, the mountain of the Lord. But when God gave his people the law, he wasn't saying, here's a new thing that does away with the old thing. Now, instead of being blessed through the promise I gave to your great-grandfather Abraham, now you'll be blessed by keeping these commandments perfectly. That was never the purpose of the law. And in fact, no one could keep those commandments perfectly. No, God's inheritance, his will, was still the one that he had established with Abraham. His will still stated that all people on earth would be blessed through the seed, through the descendant of Abraham who was to come. But if the law wasn't given to give salvation, Paul goes on, why then was it given at all? It was added because of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. The law was given through angels and entrusted to a mediator. A mediator, however, impl implies more than one party, but God is one. Is the law, therefore, opposed to the promises of God? Absolutely not. For if a law has, had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. But Scripture has locked up everything under the control of sin, so that what was promised, being given through faith in Jesus Christ, might be given to those who believe. The law isn't meant to deliver us from sin. If it could do that, if it could bring us righteousness in life, then we would have never needed for God to give Abraham the promise. 
But the purpose of the law wasn't to give us righteousness, wasn't to bring us life. The purpose of the law was to show us just how badly we needed the promise. The law was given to show us that we, along with everything else in this world, are locked up under the control of sin. To show us that just as much as anyone else, we are guilty of rebelling against God. Just as much as anyone else, we are deserving of death. It was given to keep us looking for, to keep us waiting for the seed that God had promised so that when he came, we might receive that which he promised to bring us. And the seed came. Jesus did come. God kept that part of the promise. And so you and I now are able to receive from him the thing that he promised he would bring. Abraham knew it as the blessing. The blessing that his seed would come through which all nations on earth would be blessed. And you and I know it by another name. We call it this big fancy word, justification. It's five across in the crossword puzzle at the beginning if you want to put it in there. Justification, this wonderful gift from God that even though every one of us here is as guilty of rebelling against God as anyone else from all creation, anyone who has ever lived, that we have been saved by the seed, by our Savior Jesus. If God were to open the ground to swallow us alive, if God were to bring a tower crumbling down on top of us because of our rebellion and sin, he would be justified in doing that. But that isn't what he's done. And so listen tonight, hear exactly what it is that God has done for you. He has blessed you through the seed. That means that he bent down into this world. God, the creator, bowed before you, the created, bowed before you, a sinner, in service to you. Jesus, the promised seed, the promised descendant of Abraham, came into this world and clothed his true godliness, his true divinity in true human flesh so that he could live the perfect life that you have failed to live. So that he could endure for you the punishment that you could not have endured. So he could offer his body on the cross and endure the payment of hell that each and every one of us deserves for our sin. And then on the third day, he rose again so that he could make a declaration that you have been justified. You are justified. Justified not in receiving punishment, not in being smitten off the face of this earth, but you are justified in receiving the inheritance of heaven, the gift of of everlasting life from the one who gives life. And he is justified in giving it to you. Because the only thing keeping you from that life, your sin, he has dealt with, he has done away with through his death on the cross for you. That is the promise that we turn to. Having heard it once again, let's Let's return to our lives and live lives of repentance, listening to the words of Jesus who says, turn and live. We turn from our sin. We turn to our God and his promise, this promise that we have been justified. We have been declared not guilty because he was declared guilty in our place. He paid the punishment, and now he clothes you in his justness, his righteousness, his perfection. And so in that perfection tonight, in that justification, we find forgiveness and peace in Jesus. Amen. May that peace of our Lord and Savior Jesus, which goes beyond our human understanding. May it guard and keep your hearts and minds in him until life everlasting. Amen.